Uh, it's time to take a look at news stories making headlines around the globe. Acting Managing Director of the Niger Delta Development Commission, Daniel Ponde, about to suffer a fainting spell as the House of Representatives Committee on NDDC yesterday grilled him. Ponde had been questioned for over an hour before he appeared to faint. Uh, several people tried to help him as the proceedings was halted. He briefly regained consciousness and was then carried out of the hearing room. Meanwhile, the Minister of Niger Delta Affairs, Godzilla Babu, has accused members of the National Assembly of being beneficiaries of contracts awarded by the Niger Delta Development Commission. The revelation obviously unsettled members of the committee. He, however, feigned ignorance when asked if he received the said contract during his time as a minority leader of the Senate. But as well, let's talk about this. We saw drama unfold yesterday. We saw a uh, session. Uh, um, we also saw another, uh, uh, you know, medical incident that, um, that, that, that was on yesterday on television. The social media was awash with stories. I mean, what do you make of all of this? The four-day, you know, uh, in, in, inquisitorial panel, I should say, is finally over. What do you make of all of this going forward? Well, um, let me say, as a Nigerian, I saw a proud moment yesterday and several other embarrassing and disturbing moments as well. The proud moment for me was when the chairman of the House Committee accused himself. Mm. It's not something we see all the time. Mm. Uh, although there are allegations, he found it necessary and important to step aside, mm. to allow for the investigations to go on. Mm. Aside from that, Justice it's, Bukachua does something like that. She's, re she's recused herself. Yes, yeah. for, for the PDP, for when the PDP, PDP accused yeah. her yeah. for... And it's not something you see. It's not common. Yeah. It's not common. So for me, that was a proud moment. But every other thing was just, it's a Pandora's box of allegations and counter allegations mm -hmm. as, uh, when it comes to corruption. That's what we're seeing. And in all of this, I don't see how this benefits the people of the Niger Delta how, region. How, how, how does it make you feel what you saw yesterday? Sad. I must say, sad. Uh, there are many moments I can pick on. But let me go to that one you talked about, the health uh, challenge. Um, I don't blame those who say, he might have been faking it. But I was troubled, deeply troubled, that a lot of people would put conspiracy theory ahead of someone's life. It could have been real. And so what would we have been saying? Mm. And then the NDC has now said, Mr. Ponde has not actually been feeling fine for the past two weeks. Mm. He came to that hearing yesterday against medical counsel. Mm. He thought he could pull through. But then again, the immediate response he got was abysmal. In a time of COVID-19, we're seeing someone mm. attempting to do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Mm. Put his bare hands in Mr. Ponde's mouth. Or washed. I, well, I, I, I didn't get I, I, think I, I didn't just understand it. Mm. I think it's in order that uh, the, uh, uh, the chairman of the House of Rest Committee on the NDDC recused himself. That's Honorable Tunji Ojo. Mm -hmm. Because he was pointedly accused by uh, Kemet Daniel Ponde, mm. uh, professor, chairman, of the uh, IMC of the uh, Niger Data Development Commission of being an interested party in the matter. And so he recused himself. Now, that's perfectly in order yeah. because the whole idea is to show that the House of Representatives in exercising its oversight functions is also at the same time uh, cognizant of the fact that it had to allow fair hearing. Mm. Uh, fair hearing means that, you know, you know uh, the parties involved will not be persons who are already uh, uh, compromised in one way or the other. Now, the drama that uh, occurred yesterday, many Nigerians were not amused by it. Wow. Uh, they thought it was a serious matter. They are now beginning to refer to it as what they call the Ponde syndrome, mm. <laughs> which is a syndrome that, you know, Nigerians have seen before now, when persons are asked to uh, respond to allegations uh, they either fall sick or they collapse or they come to the uh, place of interrogation on a wheelchair or they neck come braces. with uh, neck braces and all of that. Not warm properly. You know, well, I mean, this is what, you know, Nigerians are now saying. Yeah. But I, we are all concerned that when a person is asked to respond to allegations, the person must be in a fit, um, you know, state of health uh, to be able to respond to those allegations. And what happened? eventually yesterday, was that the Speaker of the House of Reps took over the uh, proceedings and then declared later that uh, Professor Ponde uh, can give written submissions mm. uh, and that he does not need to appear. However, the more important thing also that occurred yesterday 
was a testimony by uh, Senator Goswila Pabio, the Minister of uh, Niger Data Affairs. Mm. Uh, he responded in 16 paragraphs. And, but the high moment for Nigerians was when he pointed out that, in fact, the major beneficiaries of contracts from the NDDC are members of the National Assembly. Mm -hmm. And Nigerians were thoroughly amused mm -hmm. when, at that point, he was now being asked, uh, you know, uh, OK, OK, Senator, OK, OK, as if he was being uh, hushed up. Mm -hmm. So Nigerians thought, could there be a cover-up here? Mm -hmm. uh, before him, um, uh, Dr. Karo Jugo had already made the same point in the media. Mm -hmm. uh, but to hear the senator himself saying that, look, it's you people that are the major mm -hmm. beneficiaries, was quite uh, instructive. Okay. However, <laughs> What has now been revealed is that Senator Akpapio himself, because it looks like the fingers are pointing in two directions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a document in circulation now showing that he himself approved as Senate Majority Leader, as Chairman okay. of the uh, ND, uh, as uh, Minister of the uh, Niger Data Affairs Ministry, okay. projects for his own constituency. Mm -hmm. So does he have the moral right uh, to accuse members okay of the National Assembly. So that is the question that is flying there, and I think Nigerians will get to know a lot more yeah. as the uh, investigation of the NDDC continues. But he confirmed mm. that there is a forensic audit ongoing. that is ongoing, yes. uh, contrary to what some other persons that have alleged. Said, I mean, Kola Wale has said that there's no forensic audit, and uh, John Nene has also said there's no forensic audit. So let's go to the second story now. Second Republic Minister and former President of Newspaper Proprietors Association and businessman Alaji Ismail Isa Funtua has died. He was 78. A sister publication reports that the founding managing director of Democrat newspaper died of a cardiac arrest yesterday. Reputed as a close confidant of President Muhammad Buhari, he was a life patron of Newspapers Proprietors Association of Nigeria and chairman of Bullet Construction Company. Isa Fujua was born and raised in Katsina uh, State, and he was to, he's today to be buried according to Islamic rights. I mean, Dr. Abati, I'll give you the honors uh, to start on this, because I think the last major television interview that yeah. Isa Fujua did was with you. That was uh, about six months no, ago. It was not just with me. It was with me and Tundu Abiola. Yeah. It was on this program, The Morning Show, on January 3, um, 2020, yeah. where he addressed a number of issues. And I've seen the video of that interview already in circulation. Um, uh, Alaji Issa Funtua's death is a major loss to the media industry. He was a life patron of the International Press Institute. He was a major bridge between the Nigerian media and the international community. Uh, he was also a life patron of the Newspaper Proprietors Association of Nigeria. Uh, indeed, you could say he was a godfather uh, in the media industry in Nigeria. We have many godfathers. He was one of them, and perhaps the most prominent from the northern part of the uh, country. Uh, he was uh, a bridge builder, yes. and uh, he had significant experience as a leader in Nigeria. Mm. Uh, he was part of the Constitutional Conference, 94 to 95, and he was one of the major opponents of military dictatorship in Nigeria, for which reason his name showed up on the Abacha hit list. Yes, yeah. um, and, uh, I mean, uh, many young no journalists uh, looked up to him. Uh, and then beyond that, he has been a major influence in the, uh, uh, in the Buhari administration. He's a lifelong associate, ally, and friend of President Muhammad Buhari. And it were, he helped a lot uh, to help manage the media uh, for President Buhari. And I guess, you know, there's an allusion to that in terms of his uh, value uh, to the president in the statement that has been issued. Uh, by President uh, uh, Buhari. He also later, I mean, uh, we must also know that he was a founder of the Democrat newspaper. Yeah. I mean, as a graduate new, uh, student, I wrote uh, a number of articles for that newspaper, and it was uh, a very significant uh, newspaper, uh, you know, at that point in time. And he remained in the media. Mm. And then beyond all of that, of course, uh, is the fact that he became an entrepreneur yeah. Uh, he founded a bullet construction company, yeah. a bullet international construction company, uh, which uh, built many of the iconic, iconic buildings uh, in Abuja. Yeah. And he had great experience. He was a minister of water resources under the Shagari government. I hear he was the youngest. Yeah, he was the youngest minister at the time. And uh, he had... He, he, he had, had, had food to textile, too. Yes. Uh, he had vast knowledge of Nigeria. Uh, 
you will be greatly missed. It's a major loss, not just for the uh, media industry, but also uh, for the business uh, sector. sector. Uh, you know, and if you look at many of the comments, with the exception of uh, the attack on him by Jackson Uday, mm. my very good friend, uh, you see that many Nigerians are really concerned that we have lost him at this very strategic time. And I think we should commiserate with his family and also particularly with uh, President Mohamed Buhari, uh, who must be finding the villa very lonely at this time mm. because many of his friends are just leaving. Uh, it was uh, Abakari the other day. Now it is, uh, it is uh, Isa Funtua, but he lived long. He was 78, we're told. Mm. He died of a cardiac arrest after he suddenly uh, fell ill. Uh, but, you know, we'll remember him as a man who did his own beat, as a journalist of the highest rank, mm. and as a media leader in the media industry, and as an entrepreneur. I mean, there's no doubt he's left his mark on the sands of time, and he's left a baton to the generation to come. All right, that's all we can take on news headline. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have the trio of Rotos, Michael, and Aaron to give updates on Africa and global business and COVID-19. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. Our ever-dependable Rotus Odiri is now here to give us the Africa business update. Good morning, Rotus, and over to you. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, uh, this one. Good morning, uh, Rufai. Good morning, Good morning to you all. So we're going to talk female leadership. Uh, the top story over on uh, our sister publication this day, uh, front page, um, is that Fidelity Bank Board of Directors has appointed a new managing director, CEO. Uh, it's uh, going to be uh, ne Mrs. Neka Onyali Ikwe. She's the current executive director, Lagos and Southwest Directorate, and uh, she takes over uh, as of January the 31st of 2021. Uh, she's going be taking over from uh, Mr. Namdi uh, Okonkwo. He, of course, was appointed back in January of 2014. He steps down as of uh, the December the 31st. And, you know, she's coming on board at a time when, you know, banking industry is facing headwinds you know, due to COVID-19 and a number of challenges. Um, it will be interesting to see where we are in January of 2021 when she assumes uh, the helm. But she's, of course, a very, very capable leader. And, you know, one of the undertones of this year, even though COVID-19 has taken all the headlines, is, is female leadership. Um, um, as back in March, uh, Stambik IBTC in Uganda appointed their first uh, uh, CEO. Uh, and so, I mean, this year, our very own managing director here at Arise News, uh, Ijoma Wogu, was uh, named the most powerful woman in, uh, in Nigerian uh, journalism. Uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Ewela might become the next uh, director of the World Trade uh, Organization. Even if she doesn't get the position, the candidate from South Korea, another very capable woman, might also get uh, the position. So, it's it's been uh, it's one of the you know one of the headline one of the sub headlines of 2020 with regards to female leadership. So congratulations to uh, Mrs. Neka Onyali Ekwe, and uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you know how she guides Fidelity Bank uh, in in the uh, in the new year. Uh, more female leadership. This now we're going to be talking about a senator from Adamawa Senatorial District, Adamawa uh, Central, uh, Senator Aishatu Dahiru Binani. Um, also saw the story in uh, in this day as well. She is of course. The founder of the Benani Group of Companies, a printing press uh, company. It's uh, rumored that she is uh, looking to float a domestic uh, airline. Uh, our sister publication this day spoke with a source, an anonymous a source who chose to speak anonymously, uh, that she's looking to float a, a domestic airline. They've uh, approached the Nigerian Civil Aviation Authority. And um, that is, is, is looking like that might actually happen. So, of course, from the northeast uh, part of the country, they are now going to hopefully see a domestic airline enter the fray. If we take a look at the CEO of the company, uh, Aminatsu Dahiro Chiroma, there she is. That's the CEO of the Binani uh, group of companies. She's also been working behind the scenes, according to uh, the story in our sister publication this day, to get this domestic airline off the ground. Now, of course, again, very brave move considering the challenges that the aviation sector is facing, the job losses, the loss of profits. Um, for To float an airline in this period of time, you know, of course, it takes a lot of planning, takes a lot of bravery, and uh, we, we, do, we do wish them luck. It's also going to be interesting to, you know, ticket pricing and a whole number of other issues that the aviation industry has to grapple with. So coming into this business at this time, very brave, very brave. But again, we need the jobs. The economy needs more companies coming up. So this is also uh, pretty good, uh, pretty good news. Uh, to the central bank, um, 
Well, I did say that they would hold rates. A number of other economists and analysts said that the central bank would hold rates. So there we are. The MPC decided yesterday to hold steady. So nothing's changed. The monetary policy rate remains at 12.5%. The asymmetric corridor, which is the room that you have around which you can increase or decrease the NPR, uh, stays at plus 200, minus 500 basis points. That's also unchanged. Cash reserve ratio, CRR, that remains at 27.5%. That's also unchanged. And the liquidity ratio at 30% unchanged. Although, if you add that CRR and liquidity ratio, 57.5%, again, you know, if, if, if you are saying that, look, perhaps the central bank should consider easing um, one of those metrics, especially the CRR, but the central bank will argue that, hey, in the event of a financial crisis, you know, you want to be able to have a backstop that can assist the banks in case there's any issue. So there's two ways to look at that. Um, there were also some folks who said the MPC didn't um, say anything about foreign exchange, but then... The CBN normally, many foreign exchange announcements, Doctor was asking yesterday about the situation with the backlog of FX, you know, and I said, hey, the CBN has said that they will address that, in, you know, and they are going to address all foreign portfolio investors. So it's not their style to announce anything on FX at MPC. It's usually going to be put out in a circular. So steady as she goes with regards to the Monetary Policy Committee. And then also the um, CBN also made an announcement, uh, the Serbian Governor Godwin Emefile made an announcement about an um, infrastructure development company uh, to the tune of 15 trillion naira. It's going to be assisted by the Africa Finance Corporation, the, the AFC, and also the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority. So they are hoping that this is going to, I think it believes about five trillion over the next uh, uh, three years, uh, where they plan to push this, uh, push this together. The question, though, is how they want to make back their investment. Are you, as far as infrastructure, I mean, what infrastructure are they going to focus on? Is it going to be roads? And if it's roads, are you going to toll the roads in order to make your money back on your investment? So how they do that is going to be interesting to see. But it's a big announcement that was made by the central bank governor because a lot is tied to our infrastructure, rail, roads, you know, um, storage facilities for bringing farming products from uh, the rural areas to the, to the urban areas for sale. There's a lot there. So Nigeria definitely has an infrastructure deficit that has to be addressed. And the central bank, you know, with the announcement they made yesterday, uh, with powerful support, of course, from the AFC and from the NSIA, it's going to be interesting to see how that moves forward. Very much needed. And, uh, yeah, there you go. So there's the AFC, of course, and the NSIA. And that's, uh, that is our Africa business update. Well, Rutus, first uh, let us uh, congratulate uh, Ineka Unyali Ipe, who has now been appointed the next... Uh, uh, MD CEO of Fidelity Bank. You recall that um, not too long ago, I think about two weeks ago, you brought a story about the appointment of Mustafa Chikobi as the uh, chairman uh, of the same bank. Right. And what we see here is that businesses are repositioning uh, in the expectation that post COVID 19, you have to reposition not just in terms of the workspace, but also in terms of uh, human resource. Mm. Uh, my only concern, I mean, on radio this morning, I was hearing people saying, oh, this is a gender achievement. Uh, you know, a woman is now the head of a bank in Nigeria. Well, I, I don't think we should overplay the uh, gender uh, uh, card because that would be a bit patronizing. Because if you look at the uh, profile of Ineka Oyali Ipe, uh, she has a, you know, very uh, rich experience. Uh, she's been in the banking profession for almost uh, 30 years. So to say this is about gender mm. is not it. I think that the uh, board of the uh, Fidelity Bank has given her this recognition on the basis of her own personal achievement and distinction. Yes. So, but, you know, some gender advocates can say, well, oh, a woman is uh, on the top. But the point that we have consistently made is that, look, uh, every woman is as good, you know, man, as right. anybody. Right. You know, after all, the first woman uh, to fly a combat uh, helicopter pilot, uh, uh, to be a combat helicopter pilot is uh, a woman. Right. Now, that's the point. Now, uh, you left out uh, the other gentleman, the chief risk officer, uh, who was also promoted. Calvin, I think, is his name. Okay, yes, uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah, who has now been made an executive director at the Fidelity uh, Bank. Uh, congratulations yes, also to him. To him well. And we're likely to see more of this repositioning, you know, at, at the human resource level across businesses. Yes, now, as for the CBM rates, the MPC uh, meeting that took place yesterday, you yourself, you had predicted that you did not expect uh, that there would be any changes. 
And what we have seen is the uh, Monetary Policy Committee uh, adopting its regular, usual, you know, for more than three years, uh, cautious stance. Yes. And I think that that makes sense. Uh, they may not have made a pronouncement on uh, FX, Forex, uh, for, uh, foreign exchange, uh, also because they're trying to be uh, cautious. Right. You know, so these are some of the issues, but uh, we'll see how it goes. We will. We'll keep we watching. Will. We will. But the bigger challenge for the uh, CBN and for the people on the fiscal side of the Nigerian economy is to see how they look at all the indicators and make sure that uh, everything works in the best interest of the Nigerian economy. Indeed. Indeed. Well, thank you very much, Rotos Ujiri, so for much. the updates. Now, let's turn to London, where Michael Wilson is standing by for Global Business Updates. Hello, Michael. Good morning. Michael morning. Uh, Asia Hello, Michael. stocks. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Asia stocks building on gains. There's a, there's a feeling of optimism uh, around investors today, and there was yesterday as well, about um, vaccine plus uh, uh, two, two vaccines really in focus. We'll come on to those in a second. Uh, plus also this uh, European deal. Now, the doc, good doctor uh, asked me yesterday whether I thought there would be a deal done, and lo and behold, there was a deal done. Uh, and once those feet were held to the fire. Um, yes, they actually decided. I'll come on to the detail of it in a second. Um, you flashed across the American markets there. Another re record for the Nasdaq yesterday, S&P, which what some people say is much more representative of what's actually going on in the US economy, um, as opposed to the, the Dow Jones uh, at its highest level since February. But Here's the thing, here's the rub, that California recorded a 12,000 increase in COVID uh, cases yesterday in one day. That's the highest since the pandemic started. So there was political theatre and there was mission impossible uh, with the European leaders yesterday. But they did actually at four o'clock this morning get together a recovery package for Europe. It's split between grants and loans. Some of those loans are on very good terms for countries. Um, and there was a problem, if I can just say that this, this frugal four business between Holland, Austria, Denmark and Sweden, those four countries actually completely holding the others out to dry. They have agreed a one trillion um, euro uh, budget over the next seven years. So we're talking about a huge amount of money. How this actually filters down to countries like Spain and Italy who have their own problems, I don't know the answer to that. We'll see over the next few days. But the markets liked it and they'll continue to like it today. Um, Domestically speaking, if I may, um, UK borrowing uh, is now more than G more than our GDP, and the the monthly figures came in slightly better than expected, but still a whopping thirty five and a half billion pounds um, that which is, which is keeping going uh, furlough schemes, in other words, paying um, private uh, private com private sector employees to be off work. Uh, but it also takes into account a slightly higher uh, tax take because people were beginning to spend again and beginning to go to restaurants and so on, but in no big way. Uh, Mike Pompeo, um, the US Secretary of State, is in London. He'll be talking Brexit, he'll be talking trade, and he'll be talking China. It's a two-day visit began uh, yesterday. I think there will be pressure to do more to keep Huawei out of uh, UK technology. And and also um, there will be uh, there'll be more there'll be more talk about the, the stance that the UK is actually taking with China at the moment. Quite a Cold War going on. And as I was talking about that um, that drug um, optimism, this vaccine optimism hitting the markets. Remember that the United States has already ordered. Um, 300 million doses of this AstraZeneca uh, drug, which is being developed uh, in conjunction with Oxford University. There are high hopes that may be ready by the end of the year, uh, but it obviously does. I mean, there's quite a high bar to this because remember, a vaccine is something that you give healthy people to stop them becoming unhealthy. So it's got to have a very, very high safety, um, uh, uh, high safety. Um, uh, 
part and our house safety composition to get through some stringent demands, not just from our drugs, but your drugs, people, and also the, um, the American ones as well. As far as the UK is concerned, the Bank of England chief economist is still banging the drum for a V-shaped recovery. I haven't met anybody else who thinks that that's going to happen here, but he does. He thinks that also the UK economy has uh, clawed back about half the ground um, that, that, that was act has actually been lost, and that's despite the fact that, uh, well, you'll know the name of Marks and Spencer. That adds to Boots and John Lewis. They laid off 5,500 people last week. Marks and Spencers um, are after some cuts now of about 900. They'll be senior management jobs, but at the same time, they're painting that picture of retail not doing very well at all. Um, as far as uh, commodities are concerned, nothing really to report about the oil market. I'm still banging on about copper actually being a good investment. And iron ore has ticked up as, as China is clearly um, getting back uh, into, into growth figures. Whatever they actually say about them, whether whatever doubts you have and all the rest of it, there's still something going on. And iron ore is a primary indicator of that. And that's the global scene this morning, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, uh, Michael. Uh I just wanted to talk about uh, the EU fund. Uh, it didn't come just like that. It came with a lot of arm twisting. In fact, I was checking a report this morning on The Economist that uh, the numbers had to be reduced as regards the number they got for grants and the one that was going to be converted to loans. I mean, can you talk us through that? Because it was a real deal negotiation yesterday. There was, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the problem was that the Frugal Four uh, and other northern states were saying, you, we're giving away too much money. We, this cannot be a grant. We have to increase the level of uh, loan value in there. In other words, this money has got to be paid back, and it comes with some pretty stringent demands, as Greece actually found out. Do you remember the Greek uh, crisis that it had there? So there were some very, very strict things applied to this. The total of $750 uh, billion is still the same, but the, the, the terms within also include some of those Europe, northern European countries getting rebates from the European Union in the same way that the UK battled all those years ago under, you'll remember, Margaret Thatcher getting a rebate from the EU for the amount of tax that we paid. So there's a lot of horse trading going on, but they did eventually come to a deal. Now, as I say, that's that. That's the headline. That's what the PR people and the politicians which have you believe. The implementation of it I think will be very, very difficult indeed. I would like to see a lot of people looking at this and making sure that the money actually is being spent in the way it was intended to be spent, because there will be there will be a lot of doubt about that. But you're absolutely right. It wasn't quite the deal that was um, that, that was presented as ought to be agreed four or five days ago. Well, Michael, very briefly, I mean, what are the implications of the situation in which the UK has found itself? A debt total that is close to two trillion uh, pounds, and then uh, budget deficit that is, uh, you know, highest since uh, 1993. What are the implications for economic yeah, recovery? We are a very small economy, as you know, and you're quite right to draw attention to that. And somebody somewhere down the line is going to have to pay for this. When that payment will actually happen, not quite sure. There are only three real ways of getting a bigger tax take. You've got to attack the big taxes, national insurance, income tax, and also VAT or purchase tax or whatever you, whatever you care to call it around the world. Those are the only three things that actually bring in a lot of money. So I think you're going to have a two-pronged thing about this. It's all right, actually, saying this. The reverberation of this borrowing, and it's not over yet, will carry on down the years. You'll find households in this country have less money. Uh, I suspect that wages will probably go down. And then we have the dreadful prospect of much higher unemployment. That is absolutely there and it's absolutely unavoidable and what what you will see is a load of just like in, in in africa just like in nigeria a whole new raft of entrepreneurs who will try to make new businesses will try to disrupt businesses which are not adapting properly properly particularly in retail so i think we've got a whole new landscape coming up okay thank you so thank much, you very Michael. much Michael. And now for an update on covid-19 pandemic globally Erin Akarijala is here hello Erin. Good morning, Adesua. Good, good morning to you, now. Doctor. Good and morning. good morning to you, Rufa. And let's morning, get yeah. straight to it. We'll start here from the continent of Africa and how 
things are playing out. Usually, of course, the weekly briefing of the WHO held yesterday at the press conference, and there have been talks about how things are shaping up in Africa. Usually, at a certain point, we are celebrating Africa with low numbers of infections in terms of COVID-19, and not just low numbers alone, also low mortality rates in terms of deaths. But at the moment, they are warning that it is beginning to spiral out of control. But before we break it down, looking at the cases in Africa right now, we are up to 721,563. All right, the deaths, about 15,168. You can actually see on the right side of the screen there, the southern part of Africa has a huge spike. Not just, of course, South Africa making up the most in that particular block, but the southern part before the northern and the western. Now, trying to break this down, looking at um, some of the graphs we actually have, looking at the the map of Africa right now. You can actually see the circles that actually indicate the level of infections. South Africa has the highest overwhelming, followed by Egypt, then places like Nigeria, and then Ghana, Tanzania, I mean, Tunisia, then Morocco. Now, trying to break it down by region to help us understand this. Moving on. Now, this is the southern, this is the graph of the southern part of Africa from some from April till now, you can actually see the rise. All right, steadily. At some point, it was little, it were little or nothing in Africa. Then the spike has been going up, and ever since it has peaked at a certain level, it has not come down. We are seeing close to about 14,000 cases in South Africa every single day, and they are warning that this is it should not just be limited to what is happening in South Africa alone. That the fact that what has happened in South, South Africa has spread to other southern part of Africa that it could move as far as the entirety of the country, uh, continent. Because when you look at other sides of the continent, moving on now to the next slide, this is the northern part of Africa. You can actually see at the beginning stage of this pandemic in Africa, all right, the northern part were making up for most of the numbers. Then there was a sharp rise, and now things are beginning to flatten. The curve is beginning to flatten for the northern part of Africa. Now, same as the western part of Africa also, where Ghana and Nigeria have the highest case load, we saw a sharp rise at a certain point, and things are beginning to flatten in the last one week, not as much as at some point, as you can see the graph little there. And they are claiming that right now, Kenya are having an increase in number by 31%. Madagascar's number is rising by 50%. Zambia's number is rising by 57%. And places like Namibia's number is rising by 69%. Although South Africa that we've been talking about with the most confirmed cases in the entirety of the continent are just rising by 30%. So we have to be on the lookout. The, our first wave is just beginning to peak. Unlike what we thought that probably things in Africa, that the numbers were relatively low due to the fact that um, the governments were a little bit proactive, that has helped. But at this point in time right now, with the virus spreading from the wealthy part of, of communities or the wealthy part of states now into the interlands or into the poorer parts of the state, as WHO has put it, is becoming a problem. Now, in the bit actually moving on for the brevity of time, let's actually tell you that um, what is going on right now in Saudi Arabia. They've actually announced the hard that will kick off on the 27th, and they're saying that only a thousand devout Muslims will be allowed to perform the yearly ritual of going to Saudi Arabia and to Mecca. Only 1,000 Muslims because of the cases we've actually seen in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, too, as we've seen devastation, close to about 253,000 cases have been recorded there. Over 2,000 deaths have been recorded there. And the, and the heart that will be kicking off on the 29th will only allow 1,000 Muslims, and those Muslims are the ones domiciled in Saudi Arabia. No one will be allowed to fly in from wherever for this particular exercise that will kick on, on the 29th. But before we go, all right, there, is, there, is, there are a lot of celebrations in the UK and a lot of positivity in the air in terms of vaccine. We've been talking about vaccine for a while right now. Um, Dr. Sarah Gilbert and Adam Hill, those, that, those in the Jenner Institute from the Oxford University has begun to say that there are major signs, and there are the tests that are the test results that have actually come out has been quite positive in terms of COVID-19, and they are quite confident that 
what they have tried to use that the vaccine and the shots given to people actually produced the antibodies that were necessary and they are beginning to see the antibodies actually working properly i mean the vaccine actually producing the right antibodies and the t viruses and the t viruses that are needed to combat covid 19. remember t this cells, particular t cells. t cells i beg your pardon t cells, t -cells, t -cells thank you very much yeah t cells for that particular um for this particular vaccine so which is quite promising understanding that there's still a lot to be done over a long period of time, testings are still going on. They are still trying to tweak the vaccine because it still has a little bit of side effects. People still have um, migraines uh, or headaches from it, although they say paracetamols can actually cure that. But they're still trying to put in dots the lines across the T's for this. And the UK have invested quite a lot into this. And they are hopeful that at the end of the day, they will be able to get enough vaccines because right now they've ordered for 100 million of those doses from the Oxford University, 30 million from the BioNTech and the German pharmaceutical Pfizer, and also 60 million from Valneva. Now, looking at this particular graph here, now this breaks it down. We've been bringing this time and time again, and the number hasn't increased for those that are in phase three. All right, we know that those that are in preclinical trials are still over 140. 10 in the phase one, all right, small scale safety trials are still being done. In phase two, we are seeing another 10, but only three are in that particular side. Those from China, Moderna from the US, and of course, without a doubt, the one, um, the most, the most likely of the vaccines that we might actually get, that is from the Oxford University. And let's see what actually becomes of this particular one. The, Chadox 1 and COVID 19, as that particular vaccine is actually called, is looking the most promising. And the UK government are saying that the funding they've actually put into this institute has paid off big time. And they're hoping by September they will have a vaccine to immunize, I mean, to immunize people. They're not sure how long it will last for now because they have to move trials away from the UK because the test, I mean, the number of cases in the UK are reducing by the day. So they need to probably take it to places where there are more infections to be able to try and test the efficacy of this particular vaccine. But there are good news, good news, and good news. Aaron, yes, you are absolutely correct. It's very good news. It um, increases our confidence that mm. uh, the whole world is uh, raising to a point where we'll be able to find a solution to COVID-19. Yeah. And what uh, Professor Sarah Gilbert, the Jenna Institute, and the University of Oxford, mm. what they've been able to do so far in collaboration with AstraZeneca yeah. uh, is uh, commendable. Yes, the expectation is that, look, by September or mm. by January, uh, we'll have a vaccine in place. But this is also an occasion to acknowledge the efforts of some of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, uh, companies and scientists that you have uh, mentioned on this program, mm. like Moderna, which you mentioned the other day, yeah. uh, BioNTech, uh, Pfizer, and also the Moscow State uh, Institute in Russia, and also the efforts in uh, China. Mm. But we look forward to a solution so that all of us can be uh, relieved. But in Africa, of course, the major challenge is more testing, more testing. That's just uh, it. My client That's just it. of the uh, WHO is right when he says we need to take what is happening in Africa more seriously. Thank you.